He was an old gentleman, one side of whose face was no match for the other. The eyelid drooped and hung down like an unhinged window shutter. Indeed, the whole side of his head was dilapidated, and seemed like the wing of some house shut up and haunted. I'll warrant that side was well stuffed with ghost stories. Thus, the author describes the narrator, who told the following story to an old companion one wild night about the fire in an old English mansion. Adventure of the German Student by Washington Irving On a stormy night in the tempestuous times of the French Revolution, a young German was returning to his lodgings at a late hour across the old part of Paris. The lightning gleamed and loud claps of thunder rattled through the lofty, narrow streets. But I should first tell you something about this young German. Gottfried Wolfgang was a young man of good family. He had studied for some time at Göttingen, but being a visionary and enthusiastic character, he had wandered into those wild and speculative doctrines which have so often bewildered German students. His secluded life, his intense application, and the singular nature of his studies had an effect on both mind and body. His heart was impaired, his imagination diseased. He had been indulging in some fanciful speculations on spiritual essences until, like Schwedenberg, he had an ideal world of his own around him. He took up a notion, I do not know from what cause, that there was an evil influence hanging over him, an evil genius or spirit seeking to ensnare him and ensure his perdition. Such an idea working on his melancholy temperament produced the most gloomy effects. He became haggard and despondent. His friends discovered the mental malady preying upon him and determined the best cure was a change of scene. He was sent, therefore, to finish his studies amid the splendors and gaieties of Paris. Wolfgang arrived at Paris at the breaking out of the revolution. The popular delirium at first caught his enthusiastic mind, and he was captivated by the political and philosophical theories of the day. But the scenes of blood which followed shocked his sensitive nature, disgusted him with society and the world, and made him more than ever recluse. He shut himself up in the solitary apartment in the Pays Latin, the quarter of students. There, in a gloomy street not far from the monastic walls of the Sorbonne, he pursued his favorite speculations. Sometimes he spent hours together in the great libraries of Paris, those catacombs of departed authors, rummaging around their hordes of dusty and obsolete works in quest of food for his unhealthy appetite. He was, in a manner, a literary ghoul, feeding in the charnel house of decayed literature. Wolfgang, though solitary and recluse, was of an ardent temperament, but for a time it operated merely upon his imagination. He was too shy and ignorant of the world to make any advances to the fair. But he was a passionate admirer of female beauty. In his lonely chamber, he would often lose himself in reveries on forms and faces which he had seen, and his face would deck out images of loveliness far surpassing the reality. While his mind was in this excited and sublimated state, a dream produced an extraordinary effect upon him. It was of a female face of transcendent beauty. So strong was the impression made that he dreamt of it again and again. It haunted his thoughts by day, his slumbers by night. In fine, he became passionately enamored of the shadow of a dream. This lasted so long that it became one of those fixed ideas which haunt the minds of melancholy men and are at times mistaken for madness. Such was Gottfried Wolfgang, and such his situation at the time I mentioned. He was returning home late one stormy night through some of the old and gloomy streets of the Marais, the ancient part of Paris. The loud claps of thunder rattled among the high houses of the narrow streets. He came to the Place des Greves, the square where public executions were performed. The lightning quivered about the pinnacles of the ancient Hotel de Ville and shed flickering gleams over the open space in front. As Wolfgang was crossing the square, he shrank back with horror at finding himself close by the guillotine. It was at the height of the reign of terror, when this dreadful instrument of death stood ever ready and its scaffold was continually running with the blood of the virtuous and the brave. It had that very day been actively employed in the work of carnage, and there it stood in grim array amidst the silent and sleeping city, waiting for fresh victims. Wolfgang's heart sickened within him, and he was turning shuddering from the horrible engine when he beheld a shadowy form cowering, as it were, at the foot of the steps which led up to the scaffold. A succession of vivid flashes of lightning revealed it more distinctly. It was a female figure dressed in black. She was seated on one of the lower steps of the scaffold, leaning forward, her face hid in her lap. Her long, disheveled tresses hung to the ground, streaming with the rain, which fell in torrents. 
Wolfgang paused. There was something awful in the solitary moment of woe. The female had the appearance of being above the common order. He knew the times to be full of vicissitude, and that many a fair head which had once pillowed on down now wandered houseless. Perhaps this was some poor mourner whom the dreadful axe had rendered desolate, and who sat here heartbroken on the strand of existence which from all that was dear to her had been launched into eternity. He approached and addressed her in the accents of sympathy. She raised her head and gazed wildly at him. What was his astonishment at beholding by the bright glare of the lightning that very face which had haunted him in his dreams? It was pale and disconsolate, but ravishingly beautiful. Trembling with violent and conflicting emotions, Wolfgang again accosted her. He spoke something of her being exposed at such an hour of the night to the fury of such a storm, and he offered to conduct her to her friends. She pointed to the guillotine with a gesture of dreadful significance. I have no friend on this earth, she said. But you have a home, said Wolfgang. Yes, in the grave. The heart of the student melted at the words. If a stranger dare make an offer, said he, without danger of being misunderstood, I would offer my humble dwelling as a shelter, myself as a devoted friend. I am friendless myself in Paris, and a stranger in the land. But if my life could be of service, it is at your disposal, and would be sacrificed before any harm or indignity should come to you. There was an honest earnestness in the young man's manner that had its effect. His foreign accent, too, was in his favor. It showed him not to be a hackneyed inhabitant of Paris. Indeed, there is an eloquence and true enthusiasm that is not to be doubted. The homeless stranger confided herself implicitly to the protection of the student. He supported her faltering steps across the Pont Neuf and by the place where the statue of Henry IV had been overthrown by the populace. The storm had abated, and the thunder rumbled at a distance. All Paris was quiet. That great volcano of human passion slumbered for a while to gather strength for the next day's eruption. The student conducted his charge through the ancient streets of the Pazantine and by the dusty walls of the Sorbonne to the great dingy hotel which he inhabited. The old portress who admitted them stared with surprise at the unusual sight of the melancholy Wolfgang with a female companion. On entering his apartment, the student blushed for the first time at the scantiness and indifference of his dwelling. He had but one chamber, an old-fashioned saloon, heavily carved and fantastically furnished with the remains of former magnificence, for it was one of those hotels in the quarter of the Luxembourg Palace which had once belonged to nobility. It was lumbered with books and papers and all the usual apparatus of a student, and his bed stood in a recess at one end. When lights were brought and Wolfgang had a better opportunity of contemplating the stranger, he was more than ever intoxicated by her beauty. Her face was pale but of a dazzling fairness set off by a profusion of raven hair that hung clustering about it. Her eyes were large and brilliant, with a singular expression approaching almost to wildness. As far as her black dress permitted her shape to be seen, it was a perfect symmetry. Her whole appearance was highly striking, though she was dressed in the simplest style. The only thing she wore approaching an ornament was a broad black band round her neck, clasped by diamonds. The perplexity now commenced with the student how to dispose of the helpless being thus thrown upon his protection. He was so fascinated by her charms, and there seemed to be such a spell upon his thoughts and senses that he could not tear himself away from her presence. Her manner, too, was singular and unaccountable. She spoke no more of the guillotine. Her grief had abated. The attentions of the student had won her confidence, and then, apparently, her heart. She was evidently an enthusiast like himself, and enthusiasts soon understand each other. In the infatuation of the moment, Wolfgang avowed his passion for her. He told her the story of his mysterious dream, and how she had possessed his heart before he had even seen her. She was strangely affected by his recital, and acknowledged to have felt an impulse towards him equally unaccountable. "'You have no home nor family,' he continued. Let me be everything to you, or rather, let us be everything to one another. There is my hand. I pledge myself to you forever. Forever, replied the stranger solemnly. Forever, said Wolfgang. The stranger clasped the hand extended to her. The next morning, the student sallied forth at an early hour to seek more spacious apartments suitable to the change in his situation. When he returned, he found the stranger lying with her head hanging over the bed and one arm thrown over it. He spoke to her but received no reply. He advanced to awaken her from her uneasy posture. On taking her hand, it was cold. There was no pulse. Her face was pallid and ghastly. 
In a word, she was a corpse. Horrified and frantic, he alarmed the house. A scene of confusion ensued. The police were summoned. As the officer of police entered the room, he started back at beholding the corpse. Great heaven, cried he. How did this woman come here? Do you know anything about her? said Wolfgang eagerly. Do I? exclaimed the officer. She was guillotined yesterday. He stepped forward, undid the black collar around the neck of the corpse, and the head rolled on the floor. The student burst into a frenzy. The fiend! The fiend has gained possession of me! He shrieked. I am lost forever! They tried to soothe him, but in vain. He was possessed with the frightful belief that an evil spirit had reanimated the dead body to ensnare him. He went distracted and died in a madhouse. Here, the old gentleman with the haunted head finished his narrative. And is this really a fact? said an inquisitive gentleman. A fact not to be doubted, replied the other. I had it from the best authority. The student told it to me himself. I saw him in a madhouse in Paris. <laughs>